So, all right. Oh. Good morning. Good morning, all. Thank you for those presents. And I believe we've got uh, a number of people watching online via the live stream. Firstly, to Murray King, many thanks for the invite to come and address you all today. Heather, for doing the IT and the recording equipment, and for the rest of you for uh, an hour of your time. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be time well spent, a couple of lessons learned, and some interesting stories and anecdotes along the way. Um, the key themes today, per my brief, were developing of resilience, learning how to embrace and overcome challenges, and basically how to work in a team. Now, I know these are themes that we've heard before. Um, the reason I'm here is that to give it a slightly different bent in terms of different types of teamwork, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how these lessons can be applied uh, across the board. Um, what I'm basically going to be relating uh, today to all of you is my experiences in uh, walking to the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, turns out I became the first African to do so, which is nice. I didn't even realize at the time that was the case, but uh, it's something quite nice. Uh, the obvious thing being I grew up in a warm country and I hate the cold. Um, in fact, being up here in Manchester this morning, walking across uh, with my jacket on, <laughs> I thought, wow, this is chilly. And I said to someone at the station, they said, this isn't cold, you haven't seen nothing yet. So, uh, yes, I appreciate it. It's a different story up here in the north. Lovely to be up here, loving Manchester. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you some stories about things like cold and extreme cold and how we dealt with that as a team. A little bit about myself for a start. Um, oh, just one other thing. Uh, my brief was to speak for about 40 minutes. Have some time for some questions. I've got a couple of video clips which you can then watch. Um, but please do feel free to ask questions as we go along. It's definitely not a lecture, it's more an interactive talk. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Right, so a little bit about myself. Um, grew up and uh, was born in South Africa in Cape Town. Um, loved uh, living there and obviously a warm climate, got involved in a lot of sport. Around about my late 20s, I decided it's time to see the world and uh, sorted out my visa off I went traveling. Started with a year in uh, San Francisco, which again was quite by chance. Ended up working on a yacht there for a year, sailing up to Alaska and across to Hawaii, which is great, and getting my skipper's ticket. Um, then the next port of call career-wise, um, I had done my training at Ernst & Young, classic sort of accounting and economics route. Um, came over to London, the banking sector appealed, and a business analyst route, actually, which I believe is, uh, is sort of Murray's uh, protocol at the moment. Um, got into the, the banking sector and the legal sector there, working down primarily in London, but also up in Newcastle, Birmingham, Edinburgh, and a couple of places in Europe. Um, furthering the career, but worked as a contractor specifically so that I could take a bit of time off every now and again to do things like these pilot trips, a couple of backpacking trips. Um, I think I got to 83 countries. I love travel, the experiences, the people you meet, the cultures you, you learn so much about. Um, right from an early age, I was involved in competitive sport. I was never very good at it, didn't have much ability, but I trained hard. I uh, did a lot, of, uh, a lot of hours putting in training, particularly things like marathon running and uh, triathlons. Uh, I think the latest count is 171 marathons for my sins and, and the number of Ironmen. Um, the key thing there was just, I found that the more effort I put in, the more rewards I got out. Um, a lot of people were a lot better, had a lot more natural ability, but by their own admission, my brother being one, were lazy. They rather just wanted to get up and give it a go. I was there putting in the hours. Um, and I did reasonably be well at it. And uh, it was very satisfying to see that the effort I put in really reaped rich rewards. Um, then it was off to do traveling, as I say, spent a couple of years backpacking around Asia, South America, North America, the Central Asian Republics. Then it was time to buckle down and get more involved in the, the work side of things. Um, early 2000s, a good time to be in London, particularly with the banking market. Um, before the credit crunch, obviously that posed a number of challenges in itself as a, an independent contractor. But off I went and did my traveling. Um, again, there was a lot of things there where I had to... Uh, adapt and find myself in some tricky situations, get out of them. Um, then it was a couple of other challenges. I thought, well, I've done my sport now, a bit of traveling. I wanted to do a couple of other things. So I went into my, my private pilot's license. I always loved flying. I lived right under the flight route to, in London and towards Heathrow. And so I sat and watched planes uh, as a bit of an anorak. Um, loved my flying. Then there was other challenges. I heard about this thing called the Polar Challenge, a uh, team race to the North Pole. I thought that's just the sort of thing for me. I hate the cold. <laughs> so I signed up and off we went. Um, it happened pretty quickly. We did a week of training in, uh, in Norway, another week in Greenland, then up in the Brecon Beacons doing our navigation training. And suddenly a couple of months later, we were off to Northern Canada 
And as part of the team race, we walked from Ottawa right through to Residence and then right up to the North Pole, a distance of about 600 miles. Um, very challenging, and it certainly was a bit of a baptism by fire or by cold, if you like. Um, I totally underestimated just how cold it would be and the effect of the cold on everything, something I'll get into in a little bit more detail when we run through a few of the slides. Um, another challenge that was uh, both a challenge and one that actually ended up being a good challenge was that we were a mixed team. Um, the reason I mentioned that, I'll allude to a little bit later as well, is obviously for physiological reasons, it's very different having two guys and a woman in a tent. The fact is, for us, it ended up being a hang of an enjoyable experience. A couple of the other teams did not find that. Um, I think there was just sort of too many, for want of a better term, too many chiefs and women of Indians, and they all wanted to be the leader, and there was a lot of infighting, a lot of bickering. We, on the other hand, uh, we're never really in it to win. We just were all in our late 30s, early 40s, and wanted to enjoy the experience and have an amazing experience, which we did. We're all still friends, and I think we'll be for life. Interestingly, four years later, my teammate Rachel, who is a physio from Plymouth, very useful to have in this sort of an event, phoned me up and said, Well, you've done the North Pole, you know you want to do the South. And I said, Forget it. There's no way in hang I'm doing anything that cold again. Of course, it didn't take it too long to convince me, and so off we went. So uh, we again formed a team and again had an amazing experience with uh, our third member, Phil, from Gloucester. Basically, um, how I want to tie this all in with, uh, with the key themes are resilience, how to embrace challenges, and understanding how to work in a team. I'll start with the third one. How to work well in a team is pretty obvious in the workplace. Um, we have this every day. We need something we need to do, something we need to embrace. The difference is how to work in a team when you're under a lot of duress. How do you, do you still work in a team? Do you still pull together? Often not the case. And so it was a case of adapting our strengths and working together as a team. Um, I think what I'll do is focus a little bit now on, on the actual slides of the South Pole, um, because then that draws in to what we actually wanted to achieve. So firstly, what is Antarctica? Very, very uh, high level. There's a, a map of it twice the size of Australia. It's technically a desert. Um, anything getting below 50 milliliters of precipitation a year is a desert. So it's technically the biggest desert in the world, believe it or not. The biggest cause of medical problems and even death in Antarctica is in fact dehydration, would you believe? So you're walking across the world's biggest piece of ice and yet you can't use it. You can't just scoff it down your throat. Reason being, you will then go into cardiac arrest because the temperature drops your core and you can actually die from it. Obviously, what has to happen then is that it needs to be heated, melted, and then you can consume it as water. Problem with that is it takes an inordinate amount of energy to melt ice. You are spending uh, four to six hours a day just melting enough snow to actually drink. Um, it's extremely powdery, so therefore the water content is not very high. So to give you an idea, a black garbage bin bag will give you enough water for about a cup of water once you've melted it all down. So even though it's taking an hour to do that, you'll literally get a cup of water out of it. So you can see the problem. It's not just a case of scooping up snow and melting and needing it. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, liquid energy, we're talking about things like kerosene, which we burnt to actually then reduce it down to water. Um, the other big thing is utilizing that, that heat. Obviously, the minute you finish melting it and you put it anywhere that's not near heat, it freezes solid again within a couple of minutes. So it's also a matter of team management about utilizing your energy and your time to keep something, thinking the problem through. You don't just want to melt it down, put it to a side, and you turn around again and it's frozen solid as a block of ice, because then you have to start all over again. So it's all a matter of uh, sort of team management. So that's basically Antarctic. And what we did was we came in from the north here. Roughly to give you an idea, South America is here, Europe and Africa is over here, and New Zealand, Asia is this sort of side. What we did was we came from the UK, flew into Cape Town, and then an eight hour flight to due south into the Russian base, Novo Lazarevskaya, which is the big scientific base in the north. And then we proceeded to walk straight across down to the South Pole in the geographic center. Um, scooping on to the next one, to give you an idea of size in Antarctica, that there is about 2,000 meters, two kilometers, and below that is another 2,000 meters of ice. So that's seen from a distance of about 100 kilometers away. Um, just gives an idea of the size. Four kilometers, um, you can see the jaggedness 
So that obviously all from cold flow in uh, cold flow conditions. Um, and basically, Antarctica, don't forget, is the continent. You're walking uphill the entire way. You start at sea level and you end up at 9,300 feet high. So the whole way you're going up, it's also the windiest, coldest, and driest place on the continent, on the, on the, on the planet. So you get really bad um, circulation problems. You, everything cracks up. Um, all your wrinkles start to crack. It's a really very inhospitable place. The big thing is the wind coming into your face the whole day. Uh, Catabatic winds obviously flowing from a high point to a low point. So the whole way you're going, the whole three months you were there, you've got this wind blowing into your face. Obviously, wind burn. And of course, the big problem down there is, of course, as we all know, the, the ozone problem. Um, you can literally get sunburns in places that you need from the inside your nostrils, the roof of your mouth, back of your hands. Extremely sore injuries where there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, the, the good old allergy is the six Ps. Prior prevention, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. Basically, everything you do in advance to mitigate the risk is going to pay you dividends later on. Forgetting those obviously has dire consequences. For example, pouring the fuel. If you get that on your skin, you've got instant frostbite um, because the so the evaporation point of the alcohol in the fuel is much lower than water. So the minute you drop, get a drop of fuel on, you've got a big problem. You're also about seven days away from any sort of rescue if something does happen. And of course, that's an extremely costly venture, $40,000 US dollars to rescue someone. Um, strict protocol has to be followed every day in order to prevent that. If you miss your skate call, your satellite call at the designated time, you have half an hour to then do it. If you don't do it, uh, and the rescue operation is mounted at your expense. It's three of you in a team, so you're talking 120,000 US dollars before you even realize you've missed your call. So things like protocol, teamwork, again, working to ensure that you double check each other on what you're doing. It's never a case of catching each other out. It's a case of double checking. Uh, you ask your teammate, have you made the call? Have you got the details ready for the call, which is coming during five minutes time? Again, all this prior preparation in a situation like that really does save lives. Um, the other problem down in Antarctica, of course, being a continent is crevasses. Um, the North Pole, being at sea level, you don't have crevasses, you have polar bears. South Pole, the exact opposite. No polar bears, no wildlife whatsoever, no life actually within 10 kilometers of the coast whatsoever, but you have to watch the crevasses. It means roping up, ensuring that you're roped up. It's easy to think when you're cold and tired, walking 16 hours a day, that you've tied your rope up and you suddenly realize that actually it's not tied on. You can actually lose your teammate down the crevasse. And by losing a teammate means permanently two kilometers deep, you're never going to see them again. So again, every single morning you run through a sort of a checklist. Have we done this? Have we done this? Have we done this? Yes, we have. No, we haven't. Something's broken. What are we going to do about it? Sit and make a plan as a team. Um, in terms of supplies, just to give you an idea, everything that you have to consume is carried in and everything has to come back out. By everything, I mean everything, including wrappings. Uh, you try beforehand, prepare it all, pack it into packets without all the wrapping and so on, the boxes and so on. This is our standard pulp that we used. Pulp is the Norwegian word for sled. Pack all your belongings in there. It weighed in the region of about 150 kilograms, so around about 300 pounds to start with. The good news is, as you burn the fuel off, which is the heaviest component, and eat the food, it gets a bit lighter. The flip side of the coin is you get a bit lighter because you lose weight at the rate of about one kilogram a day, about two pounds a day. That was in spite of, as you can see, eating three kilograms of chocolate per day per person, 32 Mars bars a day, and I still lost a kilogram. Great diet. <laughs> the <funny diet. laughs> um, another problem with that, you have to be very careful of the worst thing that can really happen down there is um, breaking a tooth. Um, Putting a piece of chocolate in your mouth that has been at minus 30, it's like eating a stud. It's very easy to break a tooth. There's nothing you can do about it. You literally get the leather then out and pull it out. So hopefully you don't want to do that. Um, other medical problems can be dealt with. You have a serious medical kit that you take with you with scheduled drugs, which will at least get you to somewhere where you can be rescued. But breaking a tooth, not a lot you can do. Again, prior preparation. What do you do? You carry a food bag under your arm or in your groin so that it constantly keeps the chocolate box nice and, nice and warm. <laughs> Sounds disgusting, <laughs> but it actually works. Um, it just ensures that when, it, when you stop every two hours, you can stuff it into your mouth, swallow it about 
like me too. Um, so that's our standard park we carried. Those are my teammates. Um, quite by chance, when we went through Cape Town, we saw a uh, memorial there that we never even knew existed to Robert Scott. Uh, obviously, the, um, the people like Scott, and in my particular opinion, Shackleton are my absolute heroes. Uh, they did this without poles, high visibility gear, GPS, uh, Gore-Tex, and all the rest of the modern conveniences we have, and they still got there. And obviously, in Robert Scott's case, sadly, didn't quite get back. But when you see the achievement that they did do, um, quite incredible. The reason I say Shackleton is my particular hero is he was 97 miles from the pole with his entire team. He quite literally could have done it in another two to three days. Chose to return uh, on the basis that he would rather get his team on the line, which he did. Never lost a team member in Antarctica. Sadly, he never actually got to the pole because he died on South Georgia Island, right down in the South Atlantic. Uh, on one of his attempts. But in my view, getting your team back alive, pretty good. Scott, on the other hand, obviously different circumstances, um, perished literally within sight of the lost, of the lost uh, camp, 11 miles from the end. Uh, the, the coldest winter in Antarctica in 80 years, that it was just bloody unlucky, quite frankly, that he didn't even get back. Um, so that's full, as I said, from Gloucester, Rachel from Plymouth. You can see at that stage, we don't look particularly healthy. The reason is we were trying to eat as much junk food as we could three times a day to build the fat reserves. So sort of that podgy look is uh, McDonald's and Burger King three times a day. The idea being that you want to go there as fat as you, as you are, so that you build the fat reserves to keep you warm, as simple as that. When you're there walking 16 hours a day, uh, you first lose all your muscle mass. Basically, just because you're exerting yourself, putting 300 pounds uphill, then you go up to fat. So you come back with sort of wasted muscles and a little bit this way. There we are, feeling looking quite podgy. Um, the main thing is you just want to try and keep as warm as you can. Um, after about 40 days, your body literally starts to go into destruct mode. You, you just can't keep warm anymore. Your, your muscles are wasting, your fat is just dropping off you. They reckon 72 days is the sort of cutoff point where you literally perish. Um, so we got to about 60 days, so quite, quite module with 12 days to spare, not too much, but enough. By then, of course, you are super fit, very thin, feeling the cold, but you are feeling quite bulletproof, to be honest. Have a, a short video at the end, which I can show in that regard. As I say, there's our, our standard pulp. Basically, you have your pulp with all your kits in and you have your day bag on your back. Basically, all that contains is a very thick, fleecy type jacket. The minute you sit down, you put that on because it the temperature gets very cold very quickly. Uh, our standard day was about minus 25 degrees Celsius. The coldest we had was minus 63. Minus 63, to give you an idea, you're getting frostbite within about 10 seconds if you take the glove off. So still feels about minus 20, you get used to that. On a windstill day, believe it or not, it actually feels quite warm because you're exerting yourself and the sun is reflecting it. It's, it feels warm, but the problem is minus 40. 40 degrees further cold on that, you're not actually feeling it, you're just doing a lot of damage. Um, when you're walking, all you want to do is stop. So we walk for two hours at a stretch, and then you stop for five minutes, and we repeat that eight times a day. Then you have four hours to melt the sun, get some sleep, and then two hours in the morning to strike camp. So that's basically your 24 hour day. Um, when you're walking, all you want to do is sit down. When you sit down for those five minutes, all you want to be doing is walking because it gets so cold so quickly, it's just thoroughly unpleasant. Another anecdote, a mixed team, very easy as a guy. And with respect to you, Heather, you can imagine for Rachel, her pit stop every two hours. Hold the floor over or six layers of gloves off. She did this kind of Norwegian squat type thing, like a telemark skier, and did it quicker than we did. She needed to do it to be efficient. For us, it's just a matter of downwind. You always want to be downwind for obvious reasons. You do not want to get frostbite where it hurts most. Um, and then you literally, in those five minutes, spot down as much food as you can. Um, the energy burn is, as I say, pretty extreme. You're using a kilo a day, two pounds a day. So you really want to try and get as much food, junk, chorizo, biltong, chocolate, junk into, your, into yourself as you can, and then you walk for another two hours. Even missing one of those food stops, you'd be amazed at how quickly after an hour you absolutely destroyed. You're starting to hallucinate, you're not really working very efficiently. So it's kind of, again, very important. If you notice your teammate not feeling well that day, basically force them to eat their food, otherwise they're going to just degenerate even more quickly. I'll put that one in there because it's not very often you see a 
Potch has brought in an airport with a, a sign that says Antarctica right in the middle. And I'll show you the plane we're in on now. That in itself is quite an experience. It's a, a big Illusion 76 built in Siberia in the late 40s. Very functional, works very well, but you can imagine a 70 year old plane. All sorts of things dripping down from the roof. It was actually quite an experience in itself. We wondered if we'd actually get there. Safety briefing done on a good old PowerPoint screen here. And right in the middle of the briefing, one of the pilots came down and made himself a cup of coffee as we were taking it. No health and safety. The flags on the side represent the um, countries that have scientific bases down there. And you know, you know all the flags along the way. Some interesting ones, for example, Belgium and Germany. One wouldn't expect that to be the case, but they have very big uh, scientific programs going on all around the rim. Not all the bases, the scientific bases are around the rim, the perimeter of Antarctica, except for the big American one slap bang on top of the South Pole. About the size of two football pitches. Interestingly, in terms of uh, in terms of exploration and possession, the Americans do not actually have any right to be there because they never actually went and explored Antarctica. Um, what they did was went and put a big scientific base there. No one was going to stop them. So quite an interesting one. All the rest do uh, active scientific research. So the plan we shared going down there was a bunch of us explorers and then all the rest of the scientists going on there one year the rotation down to Antarctica. The size of the thing is huge, as you can see, about the size of a six, seven story building. When they drop you off, um, they actually keep the engines running. Reason being, three days while they do the resupply. Reason being that if they switch them off, they would actually freeze up and never be able to start the aircraft again. So they tick along. You'll see in the background, uh, the good old DC-3, which has been uh, converted into something called the Basler. And that's the sort of workhorse down there flying from the edge scientific, between the scientific bases all down to the, the, uh, the central base. Um, as I say, these are, uh, are used specifically because coming in to sea on the runway, it's determined right at the last minute whether they're actually going to land or not. Um, with global warming, the runway is actually warming up. The window from landing is getting narrower and narrower. So they literally overfly the runway. If it's deemed that there's too much water or too much ice, be it's an ice runway, of course, then it's straight back up to Cape Town and eight hours back. Fortunately for us, we were able to land and uh, continue our trip. As I say, then you get transported around between the bases. We did our last week of training at the Russian base down there, uh, which was, again, an experience in itself. They literally live on vodka down there, They're just boxes of lying in the snow, drink it like cool drink. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Um, and go for 15 months at a time to this tiny little base in the middle of Antarctica. It must be pretty boring, I imagine, but doing a lot of good research. Our standard kit, you can see that is a nice sunny day. It's about minus 10 degrees C there. You've got your standard Kevlar jackets, your Vortex, about four or five layers underneath. The key thing is uh, exposed body parts, obviously your face, your ears, particularly bad, your fingers, um, and obviously your toes. Just anything further away from your central core uh, gets coldest first. So keeping your toes from freezing and your hands, tips of your ears and nose, very important. Um, you get something called frost lift very, very quickly in the wind there. We're talking a couple of minutes. And that's basically sort of a waxy looking freezing of the skin on your nose, your tips, fingers. The minute that happens, you need to get it attended to, sorted out. Obviously, not just in case of warming it up because then you can actually exacerbate the problem, but get out of the wind and get into cover. Um, there you can see as we're pr proceeding further towards the pole, uh, it gets. A little bit more bumpy, something called sastrugi, which is the Russian word basically for whipped up snow, almost looks like a lemon meringue pie. And you can see around our face, we've got heavy rough on now, goggles, snow blindness there is a big problem, obviously, with the reflection. Uh, it's, it's annoying to be constantly in that state, you're in your head a lot of the time, uh, pondering things. On a good day, it's lovely, you feel very liberated, you put your music in and it feels like you're in another world, you literally are. On a bad day, I suppose, as in normal life, you start to overanalyze things. You can't talk to anybody because you're inside all this kit and you start to suck yourself out of it. So a lot of it is, uh, again, you stop speaking to your teammates. What can we do to make my day better? You know, what do you need help with? What do I need to help you with? Try and just keep positive, gene each other up the whole time. There you can see, obviously, you're getting things like, like blistering occurs 
looking after your body pretty obviously is pretty key. Um, you know, the minute you start getting almost like in a, in a jungle capacity trench foot, you, you're no longer, you're going to be a drain on the team. So it's a matter of each checking each other's feet at night. You get a particularly nasty thing called Arctic thigh, which only affects women. And they reckon there's very little research done on it, but they think it's to do with the cellulite molecule. It's basically a free store injury. Um, I'm not sure if I have a picture in there. If I do, I'll warn you before. Basically, it creates these big scabs around the woman's buttocks and thighs. And you literally each night have to help her scrape them off because otherwise they get infected. So not very pleasant. It's the same reason that uh, women do not really get frostbite around their faces, whereas the guys all grow big, bushy, ugly beards <laughs> to keep the snow off your face. So the women benefit in that they don't get it on their faces, they can't grow a beard. Um, the flip side is they get arctic thigh whereas the guys don't. So a lot of research going on at the moment to try and determine all these sort of cold weather injuries. Um, but of course, not a lot of people have been down there for lengths of time where they've been able to do this sort of research. So they're now trying to do a bit more and see what the problems are. The standard cooking, as I mentioned, you've got your two cookers and your flasks of water, as I say, four hours each night. Once you've pitched camp, you've walked 16 hours, you're absolutely exhausted. All you want to do is go to sleep and you've got to spend four hours melting water. It's honestly the most boring job ever. Uh, the novelty goes off very quickly and the idea is that you put enough water to cook your meals, to rehydrate and to have in your flasks for the next day. These flasks here uh, are insulated so they tend to keep up water warm for a or non-solid for a fair degree of time. But of course, again, you just want to make sure that you pack them right down to the bottom of your kit so that they stay up and you can drink them during the next day. Same thing in the morning, about another two hours of melting in the snow for the same reasons. You then uh, make sure you use all that heat. For example, you put your flasks in your boots at night to make sure that they don't freeze. Nothing worse than you get up in the morning and your boots are frozen rock solid. One, they can't be used and two, it takes time to then thaw them out waste time again. So a lot of it is all about time management, about checking your teammates, ensuring what they're doing is contributing to the team effort. I mentioned um, physiologically for Rachel, obviously we were down there for three months. We had to, as a team, figure out how we were going to use that to our advantage. Uh, Rachel's view was, I'm, a, I'm part of a guy's team, you know, you need to, but we were also like, well, that you may be, however, we need to work together how we how we do this as a team. So one week per month, she would get very, very hot, probably hormone related, hot to the point of almost overhydrating. And so we figured out what can we do to work this. I, on the other hand, was constantly cold. So for one week of the month, I would pull two pogs because then I was expending more energy, keeping myself warm, also getting Rachel a chance to walk without the pole and cool herself down. So that was one of the examples where we had to work as a team and, and some difficult questions had to be asked. You can imagine um, everything happens in that tent, which is probably the size of where Murray and your city, that area for three months. When I say everything, absolutely everything, bodily functions, happy moments, sad moments, sick, sick moments, all happen. So you very, very quickly had to get over uh, niceties uh, and get comfortable with each other's bodies when you're naked, this sort of thing, all because it would contribute to the team effort. Um, as I said, we had a lot of fun um, embracing those challenges. <laughs> Did you find that out in training or whilst you were going? It's a very good question. Um, we found that out in training. Um, in fact, when I met Rachel, um, I think I've known her for one day, and they took a, a big chainsaw out and cut a big hole in the ice, and we had to jump in and to see how we did recovery. And the idea is that the minute you pull yourself out, you actually get yourself with your poles. Um, you put the tent up and you're in the tent, stop while it naked. And she said to me, what's your sermon? <laughs> I said, well, there's an interesting one, right? And uh, we rapidly had to go into survival mode and figure out how to get her warm again. Literally, I mean, I had my feet in her armpits and we stopped while it naked, getting her to figure out how it worked. The point being, uh, we realized very quickly in training, that's actually how we formed the team. We didn't enter as a team, we were two individuals. And that's when I realized, you know, I can definitely work with Rach and she, I think, realized she could work with me. Um, so a lot of it, you're right, was determined in training, which we could then apply down in the field. But um, obviously, this was much, the training was a week, this was three months. Uh, there were a lot more lessons to learn. But yeah, that was, uh, it was some definitely in training. Uh, your standard tent again, you can see on a lovely, nice sunny day, everything's happy days. It looks lovely. Again, that was probably about minus 10, minus 15. You camp up your tent, but you can see the amount of snow we've packed 
around the tent, similar to any camping sort of scenario, but it can go from that to 100 mile per hour wind in the space of half an hour. So you get there and think it's all happy days, suddenly you can blow away. You obviously, it goes without saying, you lose your tent and you lose your light. It's as simple as that. So even though there's only two millimeters of nylon between you and that, if you've pitched properly, again, in prior preparation, you have to go through your hour routine when you arrive. How we did it was we again figured out that I was probably best at the end of the day, jumping in, getting all the bedding done, starting the water, having a hot meal ready within 40 minutes of arrival. Whereas Phil and Rach would do the tent, make sure everything was secured, tie the cocks together. So working again as a team, we realized that was the best and most efficient way of doing it. Uh, I can barely cook an egg normally or fry an egg, but I was cooking all the meals. The idea being my, my deadline was 40 minutes. They had to jump in there, having been out for an extra 40 minutes, ready for that first cup of soup or whatever. Uh, so it was quite key that we all hit our, our individual goals. On a blizzard night, as I say, the wind can get up to 100, 150 miles an hour. Every half an hour, you have to go back outside in the middle of the night and pack the snow away. I say middle of the night, of course, 24 hours sunshine for three months. We never saw the night at all, um, which also has an interesting effect on your mental state and your circadian rhythm. Somehow or other, you are aware that it's 2 a.m. and not 2 p.m., even though it's bright sunshine. Um, and the reason I say that is you become more lethargic, you, your circadian rhythm drops, the standards of 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. You're not as productive, you're a bit, a bit vague, a bit more dozy, if you like. So even though you're awake and it's bright light outside, you have to just be a little bit more vigilant. If you are going outside, for example, to make sure everything's up and down, you're not getting a feel because you are just that much more uh, sleepy, for want of a better term. Um, there again, you can start to see what the conditions are doing to our skin. It doesn't even look too bad here, but it has a terrible effect on your skin. Um, a, a funny one, uh, one day I got really burnt just by being back, so I was tired, forgot to put my mask on enough, and I got really, really badly sunburned to the point that I was literally scratching at my skin. Um, dove, uh, dove into the, the medical kit to see what was in there. I just needed something that had a bit of an anesthetic in lignocaine. And of course, I dug out a red tube and I smeared myself full of this white cream. And Rachel just burst into, into laughter. And I said, What are you laughing at? This is not fun. She said, Do you really realize that you just smeared all over your face? And I said, I've got no idea. Caniston cream, it said. She said, Well, do you know what that's used for? <laughs> well, female sanitary product, isn't it? So I'd gone and smeared myself liberally with it, did the trick, had the lignocaine. But the lesson learned was. <laughs> Do not let yourself get sunburned in the first place. Um, and so I was very vigilant after that to make sure I didn't. Obviously, the further south you get, this is about a degree or about 60 nautical miles from the South Pole. You can see what starts to happen. You can see the state of my nose here. Um, and that's purely just from the exposure to the cold, the wind, and the sun. You get these things called snoticles, which are basically just the water vapor. Every time you breathe out, it condenses straight away. Um, to give you an idea, at that temperature, when you chuck a pot of boiling water in the air, it literally gets to its zenith and falls out of the side, freezes instantaneously. Um, you actually make a wee and it makes a nice big yellow with a long dog notch as it comes out. Hence, always do it downwind. Um, when you go into the toilet, uh, I do a lot of talks in the schools, and the very first question every single time is, how do you take a dump? <laughs> every single time. Um, carefully is the word. And literally, because of the card, you then just break it off with the spade. It literally comes out as a solid, has to be broken off with the spade. I mentioned earlier that everything that goes into Antarctica has to come out. Um, the reason being it's a protected area, and rightly so. You literally have to take a checklist of everything you take in and verify everything you bring out. And that includes human waste, the good old Tesco bags. You literally come out with a whole pot full of them, um, rock solid, of course, because of the cold, luckily. So there's no, um, there's no sort of smell involved. Basically below like minus 10 degrees, uh, there is no bacteria, so nothing smells. We didn't really shower or wash, obviously, for three months, but because it's so cold, you don't smell, thankfully. And the minute you get back on the plane and land in Cape Town, on the other hand, pop with the ball game. <laughs> um, the good news also it means you can't really get sick down there. You've got to be very unlucky to get sick unless you arrive with some sort of bacteria. Chances of getting ill there are extremely unlikely which is good news because that's the last thing you need. Um, things like um, sports type injuries, twisting, or, uh, twisting a leg or spraining an ankle, obviously, you've got to be careful of. 
But again, the big old ICE, ice compression elevation, you've got tons of ICE just virtually sitting in ice and it heals things pretty quickly. Any sort of cut or wound you get, unfortunately, doesn't heal for the same reason. So, virtually cutting your finger, it, although it won't separate like it will in tropical conditions, it also won't heal. So, it can just become a big problem. So, again, prevention, just be very careful working with metal objects. I say metal objects at about minus 30, a steel bolt. For example, on the bindings of your ski boot, you can literally break off with your hand. It becomes so brittle that um, it can very easily happen. Something shears off, you can cut yourself. So again, every time you're working, obviously with something like that, with metal, gloves on, speak to your teammate, make sure you're doing the right thing, because all you need to do is break your binding, cut your finger, and suddenly you've got a broken ski boot and a broken finger, and then you've got medical issues to deal with and that, that sort of thing. So I think you can see a lot of the things are constant repetition of good practice. Um, much like we do in business, get the best practice, work at it as a team and apply it. Um, again, you can then see this, for example, is my iPod wire going in here. It gets so cold that a meter long, you can just hold it out and it forms a solid piece of wire like that. Um, the big problem here is what you do not want to do is get any condensation on your skin for the simple reason that you then freeze and then you're at a risk of, of frostbite. So what you want to do is, is sort of slow and steady wins the race. Move, move steadily, but slowly. You don't want to be going up over these ridges of ice, which can be as high as eight feet. Trying to pull your clock over that very quickly. You're sweating like mad under all these six layers. The minute you get to the other side and cool down, it freezes on your skin and suddenly you've got frostbite issues. So a lot of it is, again, just management of your kit, management of your teammates, checking that, you, you know, if you've got to pull over a piece, a piece of ice, Two of you go around first and then drag it over rather than one of you pulling it over and sweating too much and ending up with issues. So a lot of it, again, as you can see, this constant theme, speak to your teammates, work as a team. I probably also need a good point to mention that often you're having a bad day, you're all tired, you've been going for a month and a half, you just really and truly do not want to be there. You've paid a lot of money to be there, you don't want to be there. You get grumpy. It happens in teams, doesn't it? What are you going to do about it? A couple of times we had to sit down and put the tent up and say, right, okay, what's the issue? Why aren't you feeling well? You realize quickly that it's nothing personal. Um, and boy, you, you have some words sometimes, but you sit down and say, okay, how do we deal with this? Do we need to sit for an hour? Do we need to make a meal? Do we need to actually just sit for 24 hours and do nothing? Um, is your stomach off? Just basically talk it out and come up with a solution because there's nobody else to turn to. You can't just leave or just throw a stop. You have to sit and work out what you're going to do. And that was probably one of the most fun parts of it, actually, in retrospect, was coming up with challenges where sometimes you'd sit down and say to the other two, how are you doing? And they would say, how are you feeling? And I'd say, you know what, it's just not feeling it. You know, really. And they're like, oh, us too. You know, <laughs> we're all feeling it. But if we hadn't spoken about it, it just would have festered. One day we just sat there for 24 hours, laid down, read our books, had a talk to alcohol and just enjoyed the feeling. And then the next day, we were more energized and motivated and we could crack on. This one I put in here just, just to show um, the good old GPS, 89 degrees, 59 and 8.70. So we were literally 30 meters from the South Pole on that one there. Um, nice just to say I actually did go there. <laughs> but the main reason for showing that is GPS doesn't work in the polar regions for two reasons. Number one, it relies on a battery. The minute you pull anything out of the battery within 30 seconds, it dies. Your phone, your GPS, anything electronic, your iPod just does not work. The mitigating thing you do is obviously you walk with the GPS under your armpit again, so it keeps nice and warm. You literally pull it out, take a bearing, and come back in. But generally, it sometimes just won't work at all. Um, and the reason for that is below minus 10, the electrons in the battery just aren't moving around. It's too cold, so it doesn't work. Also, GPS relies on satellites. Most satellites, 99% of them travel around the equator, roughly. They do not circulate like this around the world. That happens once every hour and a half. For the exact same reason, the big American base on the South Pole, they literally do all their research, get the emails ready, and as the satellite passes over, it's not enough to quickly upload everything for a few minutes. It then takes another hour and a half to come around. So if you try to rely on your GPS, it's not going to work because there is no satellite to connect to. Same reason you can't switch your mobile phone on. So what do you end up doing? You rely on a good old spiritual compass, the way they did 100 years ago. Even that, don't forget you've got your magnetic declination. So if you're off by a meter here, by the time you get to the South Pole, you're off by 200 kilometers. 
So what you end up doing, believe it or not, is rely on the shadow. Every every 15 degrees that your shadow moves is an hour, so every hour, more than 15 degrees. And the streamer attached to your ski pole. The wind, as I say, is coming from directly in the south, so you know it's coming from the south. So you can again work out where your stream is on your ski, roughly how many degrees you often keep going south. Remarkably accurate over three months. Um, obviously, you do sort of vary a little bit, but we were off by only a couple of hundred meters by the time we got there using that method. Uh, we were all quite surprised, none of us are navigators, but because it works so well, tried and trusted works. GPS gives you a nice backup, but you don't fly on it. Um, the north is a little bit different because, as I say, you don't have these catalytic winds coming, you can't use your streaming, you can still use the shadow, but slightly different in the north. You're again at sea level, where the ice crystals form there in the atmosphere it causes that to be off a little bit. So, this applies particularly well in the Antarctic and South Pole. That's a put there just because one, because it's an ice pole. This is um, the famous uh, Barber's pole that we all know. You can see lots of bits of scientific equipment in the background. The flags that fly there are the 12 signatories to the original Antarctic Treaty. And I'm pleased to say it is the most observed treaty to this day. Uh, every single country has complied to the letter, which is nice, i.e. that it can only be used for uh, scientific research and exploration. Uh, let's hope it stays that way. I, I, I fear it won't once they start discovering minerals and so on. There. But at the moment, every country has complied. There all the flags fly. Um, the only one that you can't see, which I think is just out of the picture, is, is the Union flag, but of course that's obviously one of the key signatures. Um, this actually moves um, by about 10 feet every year. Um, it's not actually the South Pole, the South Pole is somewhere around here. They measure it again on the 1st of January every single year. The reason for that Barbers Pole there, one of the reasons anyway, is that it's made out of pure silver and I particularly uh, absolutely believe in the, uh, the NASA space program in the 60s. I believe they did walk on the moon, uh, some don't. What they left there was a prism on the moon's surface, and once a year, they fire a laser beam onto that. It then hits the prism on the moon and comes back to the, to the American base. And through trigonometry, they can work out very, very accurately, precisely how far apart the Earth and the moon are. And we're talking millimeters. Um, and that's the reason for that. It's uh, one of the reasons is to enable that geometric trigonometric measurement to take place. Um, a lot of flags in the background are marking various things. They're doing obviously lots of research on something called neutrinos, atomic particles hitting the Earth. And interestingly, we were allowed into the, the base to have a tour for an hour, um, although we were camped there for a week. After that, we were not allowed in again. So we would sit outside freezing in minus 40 and they wouldn't allow us in because it's a federal facility. Now you would think something to do only science would not have no, nest, uh, no, no need for federal presence. But a couple of burly marines make sure we can come in, so it does make you wonder what else has been done down there. <laughs> Research, military, who knows? Um, I'll put that one there. I happen to, my partner's Australian, so I got there on Australia Day in 2009, so that'll always be memorable. Um, and I think that's probably, that is, that is in fact the, uh, the actual point I mentioned where every year on the 1st of January they determine the exact position of the South Pole. And uh, as I say there, you can see the, the altitude is on there, 9,301 feet. You've climbed basically three kilometers up from, from where you started. So you're pretty fit doing it. Right, how are we doing for time? Okay, oh, there we are. Um, so I think the key thing, I just want to re, re, re relate back to the lessons learned. And the key things that I learned were sixfold. Let me pull them out quickly. Personal tips for building resilience. Invest in your friendships, your relationships, and your teams. Sounds very obvious. We all have friends, acquaintances that end up becoming toxic. Um, I guess the lesson learned is you find people that never seem to, you never seem to build, build them up. They always seem to drag you down. Now, I'm not being negative. I'm obviously an optimist. But invest in those people around you and your teammates at work just as applicable that are going to contribute to the cause, contribute to you, and enable you to contribute to them. That is one of the most satisfying things I found was Rachel, for example, particularly enjoyed the fact that I was interested in learning what made her tick or conversely what did not make her tick and how we work together at the, at that as a team. And I'm speaking for Phil as well, this regard. It was very satisfying to be allowed to ask her questions about, okay, Rach, how are you feeling today? Why are you not feeling this way? 
you know, this sort of thing, so that we could then do something together for the common good. I found that really satisfying, and obviously the team benefited from that. Avoid seeing any challenge as insurmountable. I've already mentioned there were a couple of times where I honestly and truly felt I was utterly, utterly out of my comfort zone. Um, day one was massive. Guys, you know, in Antarctica, it's freezing cold, I've got warm kids. By day two, I was like, you know what, you're here for three months. What the hell have you done? I honestly did quite a number of times think, what on earth were you thinking signing up for this? Because it's just, this is too much. And we all felt that a few times. But we, we rapidly realized that we're here. What are we going to do about it? Uh, it wasn't always pretty. Obviously, sometimes cobbling together a, a solution, um, breaking of bolts on ski thing, you need your ski bindings to be able to walk forward. One day, I, I broke the bolts five times in a row. I only had six bolts. <clears throat> I was like, what are we going to do now? Good old duct tape came out. We're going to make it the Apollo 13 scenario duct tape and make the foot out of a box and this sort of thing. Um, we had to, even though the challenges seemed insurmountable, view them as not being so and try and adapt accordingly in order to proceed to the common goal. It leads on to number three, try and see the positive in every situation. Um, I've already had mentioned, uh, we're all human. Sometimes it just doesn't seem to be a positive in it, does it? Even though I was there technically, if you like, on leave or holiday, it was anything but. I was freezing cold, I was losing weight, I wasn't having fun, I paid a lot of money to do it. I had to then sit and think, jeepers, you are getting an opportunity here to do something that 99% of the world's population never ever will have the opportunity to do, even if they have lots of money and want to do it. And I had to just say to myself, Phil, one day you're going to look back at this and go, you were very, very lucky. Make sure you take a positive out of it, because it was, there were definitely some days where I was thinking a bit more negatively. Um, number four, set yourself goals and celebrate the small wins. Small wins were as little as every degree we went. I took a, a bottle of, of, uh, of whiskey with me and every degree we got to, i.e. every 120 miles or so, we'd each have a capful of whiskey. We'd literally sit there in the ice, no matter what time of day or night it was, and each celebrated the capful of whiskey. That much, five milliliters, six milliliters. And the fact is it was a small win. It was just a pure mental thing of, wow, we've now achieved another degree. Uh, as I said, we started at 80, about 80 degrees, 80 and a half, and we had to get to 90, which you know is roughly about 600 nautical miles, about 1,000 kilometers. But each time we hit that degree, and it would take us probably about 10 days, so it was a small win every 10 days, but the psychological impact of actually celebrating that was, uh, was phenomenal. Um, so we celebrated the small wins because they then contributed to a big win. Look for opportunities to learn a new challenge and push yourself beyond what you believe you can. Uh, I think, particularly speaking personally, I've already mentioned this was way out of my comfort zone. I hate the cold, I still do. And yet, it was such a, a, a big challenge to overcome that. Half the reason I signed up for this was to see if I could handle the cold and how I would deal with it. It was very, very satisfying knowing coming back, uh, and believe me, I was ready to come back. It was satisfying knowing that we had done that. Um, and and basically overcome that, that that literal fear of the cold. As I said, I still hate the cold, but I don't fear it. I've learned to work with the cold, not try and fight against it. Little things like layering, it sounds so obvious. I now know that you can be at minus 60, put on six layers and be sensible, and you can actually overcome that cold. The cold's still there, the fear factor is still there, but we learned how to overcome it. The next one I've got is support and invest in a positive view of yourself. Positive internal dialogue is a strong driver for success. Uh, it's the good old gene yourself up. It's not being unrealistic, but it is portraying a positive outlook. It is being positive and coming across as positive, even if you're perhaps not feeling it. Um, again, I'll reiterate that does not mean you are going into everything promising what you are not or what you cannot achieve. You know your limitations. However, it is portraying that positive aspect particularly in the team environment. Um, when others around you are relying on you for support, realistic support, make sure you portray that because then it will come back to you as a combined team effort of feeling better about things and getting the goal done. And lastly, it's a good old simple one, but one that was obviously very important there, invest in your health, eat well, exercise, sleep well, and practice relaxation. Sounds very obvious, but once we get tired and stressed, it's very easy to forget those things. Um, one of the biggest problems or biggest issues with people that have severe depression is that the one of the first things they forget to do is things like basic hygiene, 
um, stop worrying, stop looking after themselves, which then obviously becomes a decline in spiral. So, so try and just keep that routine. Uh, I saw a really good video of uh, an American military video where one of the guys said, the first thing you do every morning is make your bed. That, that resounded with me because it means that even by two minutes after you've woken up, you've actually achieved something positive for the day. You've made your bed. Sounds small, but then your whole day is set up from then. That makes sense to me because it's easy to get up, and I'm the worst. <laughs> get up and just, oh, I'll do that later, do it later. So suddenly it's 11 o'clock in the morning, you haven't achieved much. If you've got up and made your bed, at least you can then say, I'll make my bed. It sort of makes sense to me. And that applies, I think, across a lot of other things like investing in your health, getting good sleep, trying to relax uh, in a world of increasing pressure and stress. I think sometimes we forget just to uh, just to relax and have a bit of thinking time, even if it's two minutes, clear your head, so to speak. It's easy to do that extra email, continue, go, 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 which is great. You get stuff done, but you perhaps then run yourself into the ground as well. Um, just a couple more pictures. That's obviously getting to the South Pole. Again, you can see the state of my skin by then. It took about three months for everything to recover. You have numb hands for three months afterwards. Terrible feeling. It's like pins and needles constantly wakes you up in the middle of the night. But a nice picture to have. Obviously, standing with the flag. And there we are, my details. So, okay, just in summary, hopefully um, that has given you a, a, a fair idea of the key themes, developing resilience, learning how to embrace and overcome challenges. Is that me? <laughs> have my COVID test, isn't that interesting? That interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Understand how to work well in the team. Um, so I hope that's been useful and given you a few more ideas on how we did it there, how it can be applied elsewhere. And uh, I think we've got a bit of time for, uh, for a couple of questions if anyone has. Hilton, can I ask you, you mentioned um, staying positive or portraying positivity. In your darkest moments, either collectively or individually, did any of you think we're not going to make this or our life is in question? Or how dark did that get? It got exactly as dark as that. Um, two very clear examples about halfway through, we both sat in, all three of us sat in the tent all night and just went, you know, not so good. We just, there was nothing we could do about it, but none of us wanted to be there. We literally had a good old gripe and went, you know, this has been fun. But with six weeks ahead of us, uh, again, it just made me cross my mind back to the famous explorers of old when they got there and thought, you know, there was no plan to come and collect them. They had to keep going, even if they turned around, they still had another three months to go back. And then a six month life track back to the UK or Norway or whatever. Um, it did make us really think. Why are we here? What are we going to do about it? But yeah, there were some that had meant to be going, you know, this is just not fun. Just not fun at all. The other one was um, in terms of life making, where we, we roped up. We knew where the crevasse fields were. We got quite good at, um, you can see where the snow is striating and this sort of thing. But one day we literally walked right on top of the crevasse snow bridge, they call it, and literally this whole huge area, the size of this room, just went <laughs> under our feet. Basically, all three of us would have gone down the crevasse. And we literally stood there and went, wow. It was a um, quite a moment actually where we realized no matter with all the training, if that had literally fallen through, um, there's not a lot we could have done about it. It was actually quite a, you know, people took near death experience. I don't think it was quite that, so I suppose it could have been, but it certainly made us even more vigilant and it was a real wake up call as to exactly where we were. We had maybe become a little bit lax, we should have maybe been smoked out a bit further apart. It made us realize that, wow, don't take this lightly because it can kill you. Um, so it was a bit of a, a scary moment. Hilton, you, you referenced Shackleton and his famous way in which he approached leadership. You said that Scott was unlucky. Others might take a different view. Others do take a different view. In fact, um, I've done a lot of reading, as I'm sure it sounds to me you have too, where he was perceived as a bit of a maverick, uh, but sort of happy-go-lucky. My personal opinion, and I'm basing this on the latest Ronald Fine's book written, which he uh, very much challenges some of the criticism Scott got. Um, I think in that particular example, I referred to the winter situation in his particular trip where he was just unlucky to have got such a cold winter, which then basically cost them their lives. Um, but yes, you're quite right. A lot of people find Scott to be uh, controversial, to say the least. Um, that he was prepared to put people's lives at risk in order to achieve his aims. I guess it's a moot point. I, I personally think he was a great leader. Um, definitely perhaps a bit more autocratic than, say, Shackleton and Nansen, a couple of Norwegian ones. Um, I personally think he was a little unlucky that he didn't make it that last day back because then, of course, he would have been the hero of all heroes, wouldn't he? So, um, 
So yeah, you're quite right. Uh, some people do not view him as positive, perhaps as I do. So um, that obviously that's really extreme, obviously. <laughs> um, did you apply some of those learnings when you got back to your everyday normal work life? Um, and like, how did you how do you take that extreme kind of like focus? Because that's a that's a very clear goal you've got there. Yes. How do you do that in a normal, I'd say, I'd say mundane, everyday life? How does that? Uh, uh, you're not? quite, you're quite right. Um, there's a famous example of uh, Buzz Aldrin when um, one foot from putting his foot on the moon at the age of 39 did not think. I'm about to become the second person in human history who's going to put my foot on the moon. What he did think was, the minute I do put my foot on the moon, the entire rest of my life is going to be one big, huge anti-climax. Um, having read a few of his books, that is what transpired for 40 years. He basically got sort of like, what's, all, what's the point of it all? Became a serious alcoholic, womanizer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I met him a couple of years ago, and he actually said to me, in the last 20 years of his life, he managed to pull back from the abyss, was the words he used. And realized that it was quite an achievement um, and sort himself out and is, is, is was and is a success in my opinion. Um, the point being, you're quite right, that was quite extreme. We were dedicated to that for six months, if not a year, um, and 24 hours a day for three months. To apply that on a Monday morning, 10 a.m., when the work problem comes up and you've got a difficult team member, you're quite right to hold it from ballgame. You can be as positive, positive as you like, uh, or the expectations that you think would be reasonable or not what your boss or at the food chain sees as reasonable, it is difficult to get to see them. And I do, I must have that I do, I'm even in my daily work now, still as a VA or PM, often, you know, you've got it all mapped out and you're told all the budget to cut off or you, your head counts and cuts. It is frustrating um, because even the best laid plans and all that, it's difficult to then adapt accordingly. You're right, and it is, I, I will, I'll grant you, more difficult in some ways because you can't then apply that single-minded focus of two similarly single-minded and focused team members. Team members. Uh, you have to work within the parameters of what other people are deciding for you. It is a bit more difficult. I think how I've applied it is just try to be a bit more of a realist. Um, I came back quite an optimist, uh, still am, but sometimes it's not all going to work out that way. You've got to just work with what you've got. So it's, I think it has to be more realistic and try to just cut it into your cloth. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. I hope that's been helpful and uh, you've enjoyed the talk. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Many thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Magic since you managed. <laughs> <laughs>